please welcome Shelley McKinley. Well, hello and welcome to day two, afternoon of universe. Um, I'm Shelley McKinley. I'm the chief legal officer here at GitHub. Uh, joining me today are two incredible leaders. First, we have Heather Meeker, who's the founding partner of OSS Capital and a lawyer at Tech Law Partners, LLP. And Jen Peck, who's Redfin's senior director of engineering. We are so excited to be here with them today. We'll be welcoming them out in just a few minutes. Over the past two days, we've heard some incredible stories that speak to the power of AI. In fact, we refounded our company around GitHub Copilot, a testament to our belief, not just in the tool, but in its ability to transform the world. With GitHub Copilot Chat, we're turning natural language into a new universal programming language, democratizing software development as we know it. And with GitHub Copilot Enterprise, developers can harness the power of AI at scale with personalized features, enabling them to power companies that are radically changing the world. In less than two years since the launch of GitHub Copilot, GitHub is now powered by AI at every single step. It's clear that AI has cemented its spot in history. It's simplifying tasks, it's driving productivity, and it's helping us unlock newfound creativity. Just imagine how it will accelerate and transform education, accessibility, and sustainability, enabling us to find new solutions to long-standing inequities. The, the momentum we're seeing across AI and the promise and the hope it brings for humanity is palpable. But that's only if developers have access. Think about all the announcements you've heard here at Universe. GitHub Copilot Chat, Enterprise. To bring these innovations to life, they have to be in the hands of developers, customers, and everyone here today. And a necessary step along that path is the review processes of legal, compliance, and leadership teams who want to ensure that these tools are used responsibly. In the age of AI, we are seeing a ton of excitements, which I know that you're feeling here at Universe, and we have worked with customers in the past few months we're also seeing questions in areas like intellectual property, regulation, and compliance. But let me say, do not be discouraged. This is entirely normal, just as with previous inflection points. And AI is raising new legal and regulatory questions. Think back to the rise of the internet, or better yet, smartphones and all the debate that surrounded these new tools. They're now part of our everyday lives, helping us to communicate, collaborate, and drive humanity forward. And I believe AI will do the same, but only if our innovators, our developers, have access. See, developers have been at the forefront of AI, but much of the rest of the world is still catching up. Our research shows that 92% of US-based developers are already using AI, both inside and outside of work. This means that most companies are already using AI, whether they know it or not. With demonstrated gains in productivity and developer happiness, companies are racing to adopt AI. But we've also heard from developers that they're facing blockers. Blockers to access the tools that empower them to do their best work. We don't want any developer to be left without access. So today we're going to help solve for that. As Chief Legal Officer of GitHub, I'm excited to share our insights on how to champion AI tools at your company. And I'm eager to hear from Heather and from Jen, who will share their insights and their best practices. So. I'm going to welcome them onto the stage now, and let's get started getting to yes. Yay. 
Welcome, Heather and Jen. I'm so happy to have you here. Um, let's get started. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about the cultural shift that we're seeing around the world with the adoption of AI. Um, policies are changing, enterprises are changing, and they're all being shaped by this technology. Mm -hmm. uh, in many cases, we've got tons of momentum going, um, but we've also got a few friction points that we're hearing about. Uh, I think there's tons of parallels we can draw here between open source and between AI. We mo most of us remember how open source was and the friction that surrounded that. Um, and now what we know is 93% of code is built on open source. <laughs> Give it up for open source out there. <laughs> um, so over the years, open source has become synonymous with software. And today it seems like we're seeing that tenfold in AI and how it's accelerating human progress. Um, so Heather, and anyone here who does not know Heather, Heather is open source legal royalty. <laughs> I'm a huge fangirl, um, having heard about her for years and having had the opportunity to work with her um, a few times over the last couple of years, so really excited to have you here. Um, what parallels are you seeing between the evolution of open source and AI as it relates to developers? Well, thanks for the kind words. Um, you know, in the early 2000s, I had a client who was in the digital media industry and um, asked me to create an open source compliance policy for them. So we created the policy and then we had a meeting to announce the policy to all of the developers in an auditorium not unlike this one. And uh, my client, who was a VP of legal, uh, got up and said, of course, our basic policy is that we don't use open source software. <laughs> and the entire room burst into laughter. Um, so that's kind of, well, that's definitely what happened with open source. It sort of got into organizations um, organically, without, uh, sometimes without upper management even knowing that it was being used. And, um, <laughs> And then everyone was using it. And that's exactly what we're seeing with AI today. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the most important takeaway from, uh, you know, from what's been happening is that uh, everybody is using it and they're gonna keep using it and they're gonna keep using it more. So when you talk about uh, uh, managing risk, which is what we lawyers do, you know, um, the best you can do is come up with intelligent ways to use it that minimize risk. You can't afford to say, no, we're not using it because that's going to uh, put you um, behind the eight ball. And one of the reasons I should explain that um, lawyers and management might say, no, you can't use this, is that like open source, uh, back in the 2000s, and even to uh, some extent today, we have a very unclear legal landscape underlying a lot of issues that people care about, like copyright, and the, the extent of copyright, copyright infringement, liability, privacy, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, that's why people might be hesitant, but meanwhile, the entire industry is moving forward. So in that <laughs> respect, it's, uh, it's eerily similar to what happened with open source. Thanks, Heather. And Speaking of people moving forward, Jen, we are yeah. so glad to have you uh, here today, and it's been fun getting to know you backstage and to hear a little bit about your approach to these things. Um, as part of the leadership of Redfin, you were instrumental in helping 300 developers get greenlit for Copilot. Can you talk a little bit about the culture at Redfin and how that helped you uh, get to yes? And um, you know, some people may say, like, hey, no, we're going to wait. Um, for a couple of years and just see how it shakes out. Did, did that ever consider, did you ever consider that? I, I didn't. <laughs> uh, I I'm, figured. Yeah, I'm sure there are people that considered it, but I think, you know, Heather's right. It's like people are going to use what's out there and what's available to them and what's new and exciting and shiny, kind of no matter what you do. And so I think you kind of have this false sense of security by saying like, oh no, we're not gonna adopt the thing. It's like, no, someone's adopting the thing. You just don't know about it. Um, and so we really, at Redfin, we just, we try not to let fear make any decisions for us, right? The, the way that you get through something new is by you know, finding out how the thing works, by really digging in and getting your hands dirty so that you can figure out 
what those risks are so that you can fix those gaps. Um, but also by finding someone you trust that you want to work with, um, which is why we chose GitHub Copilot, is we already had that relationship. We had already been through the review process. So for me, it was like, oh, I can actually, like, I already have that done. I can set that aside and focus on the technical implementation, and we can go back and address security risks when they appear, because they will. Yeah, great. Heather, I'll, ha I'll ask you to just double down a little bit on that question of, is there an existential risk in not adopting AI today? Well, there probably is from a business point of view. Um, it, it, it's a mistake to let legal fears about potential legal liability that in, in an unclear environment uh, drive your decisions about what you're doing with product development. I mean, it's great to be, it's great to be careful, but um, with the kind of productivity increases that we're seeing across the board with generative AI, um, it would be a mistake to not participate because of, uh, because of fear of the legal risk, but, but as we know, the employees will make the decision for you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they will. Yes, no one's ever heard of that out here, have you? <laughs> um, well, let's then, let's shift gears a little bit into the, the sort of the legal policy and compliance side. Um, certainly one of the key risks that we've heard about, the concerns we've heard about from customers is you know, is AI going to inadvertently violate copyright laws? Like, how do I have to think about that? Um, you know, as you've mentioned, it's an area that's drawing a lot of attention and concern. And so when you think about, Heather, helping organizations navigate this, um, how, how can they help, how can you help with developers and organizations really think about how to address these concerns? Well, so one of the, the biggest concerns is that the generative AI tools will take existing copyrightable material and their output will be similar to the, uh, the inputs that they were trained on. By the way, you know, we've been dealing with copyright issues in AI forever. You know, <laughs> it's just that now that generative AI is in the public eye, people are starting to really um, be concerned about this. Um, so there, there's still, the jury is still out, so to speak, on some of the legal issues. Personally, I think that training an AI model can be done in a manner that doesn't uh, infringe copyright, and also the model can be uh, created in a manner that it shouldn't, uh, it shouldn't generate um, infringing output. You've got an input risk, which is training, whether you have the right to train on information, and then you have an output risk. Does the output uh, look like uh, too much like the uh, inputs and would that constitute um, copyright infringement? So the thing is that the models have to be trained properly. And one of the key differentiators is whether the party, the company doing the training, has the right to use the inputs that they're using. And it is no accident that most of the you know, the big uh, machine learning models that you're seeing today are being put out by companies that have access to tons of data. <laughs> GitHub being no, no exception to that rule. Um, so uh, what I tell clients to, to manage risk is one, only buy from reputable developers because everybody else is scraping the web. And it's the scraping the web that actually greatly will increase the issue of um, the model not being trained properly or the inputs not um, being available for training under copyright law. Um, another thing that I say, and maybe you shouldn't even have to say this, but you do, is uh, don't ask models to infringe, right? So uh, I, I can say to a model, you know, I'd like you to um, tell me the uh, men memory management um, you know, a uh, module from, from the Linux kernel, right? And it might be able to do that, uh, but I have just asked it to infringe, right? So it's important that people who are using the AI understand that they shouldn't actually be asking for models to uh, copy specific inputs. They should be asking models to create something new based on what they need. 
And so there, there is a, an education process with mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think this is where we're also saying, you know, the industry is moving toward filtering and, co and classifying. You know, in GitHub Copilot, we have code classification. So it's about coding. Uh, it's not about creating, you know, images or other things, written, written works. If I could say one more thing, you're also seeing um, a market shift at this point where um, uh, AI model vendors are taking some legal responsibility, you know, in terms of copyright indemnities and so forth for tools that they're providing. That is still, I'd say, what is market is still developing there, but you're seeing actually many of the big providers do that too. Yeah. It's like you set me up for that, Heather. <laughs> um, you know, GitHub was the first <laughs> to provide uh, copyright indemnity on Copilot for business. Uh, we did that uh, back in, I believe it was December, um, and now certainly we've seen the impacts of that across uh, different actors in the industry. So we're pretty proud of that. <laughs> um, Jen, shifting over to you, legal teams and sort of adopting these tools, like. Yeah. How did you think about bringing these issues to your legal team? Did you bring them in early? What would you suggest to developers who are thinking about championing this at their company? How should they interact with their legal team? Yeah, I think this is, you know, a point of, I'd say, like, bureaucracy or contention for people at times. And I think if you switch the frame a little bit and really think about it as an empowering opportunity for you to understand a new tool or product from a technical perspective and be the expert for your legal team. Like your job as an engineer is to understand something and explain it in business terms and how that might impact the company. And so I think engaging legal and security, obviously early al alongside the project, so it doesn't get pulled from you last minute. That's happened to me. I know it's happened to many people. Um, that is really key because you're basically putting yourself in the driver's seat in that engagement. You're understanding how something works, you're explaining it to an internal team, and you're also building a brand for yourself by engaging with that legal team. And the next time you go to them with something, they might be like, oh, you know, that Jen Peck, she brought me this thing, you know, five years ago, and I remember how thorough she was, and she knew the risks ahead of time. Like, she brought me those risks and the mitigation for them. And so you're really building your internal brand. And so it's just that switch of frame. I like to give people that opportunity to just be like, this is your chance to be an expert in something else, to build a brand, and then maybe to slow down a little bit now, but for you to be able to speed up later for another project or for this project, you might be buying yourself some time sort of on the end when you're ready to go into production. And you talked a little bit earlier about security. You touched on it briefly. Yeah. Maybe talk a little bit like how security plays out in, in this in this way as well, when you're thinking about bringing something in, you know, how do you think about security? You know, I, I kind of think of legal and security as one, and maybe <laughs> that, you know, it has its pros and cons, but any time I'm bringing something in, you know, my team is responsible for any developer tool at Redfin, so we bring in a lot of third-party products, and we really have to understand the landscape of what that product is providing, what it has access to internally. Like, that is part of our job. And so, you know, I think just understanding all of those technical details, again, it's just going to the security team and knowing ahead of time what you're bringing in and how it works, where it's calculating what it's accessing internally, giving that information to your team so that they can be a part of that with you. Mm -hmm. um, it, it does change the dynamic of that friction that you get um, when you're in those engagements. Mm -hmm. And you're right, many, you aren't the only person who yeah. lumps security and legal yeah, together. Yeah. <laughs> we see that a lot. Yeah. Um, we've, we've tried to pull together a lot of the resources that I would say are legal and legal related, like yeah. security, data governance um, for customers into a what we call the GitHub Copilot Trust Center mm -hmm. that's available online so that customers can go there and really understand yeah. the details behind how all the, these different topics are addressed um, so that they're prepared and they certainly follow up with additional questions yeah. with this. But, you know, it's a lot of the learnings we've had from early adopters yeah. Uh, yeah. that help us understand how we are going to continue to address customers' questions yeah. uh, on a scale basis. So we appreciate all of your input yeah. and questions on that. Um, let's zoom out a little bit to the worldview of AI regulation. <laughs> um, companies are adopting AI much more quickly than 
enterprises, companies are even adopting policies around AI. Uh, developers are adopting it. Um, and also, um, much faster than the law uh, is able to catch up. That's not anything new, really. The law's never been able to catch up, as we know. Um, but there's, there's a lot of a lot of regulation that's coming down. We're seeing the EU AI Act that we think will be out of trilogue negotiations and we may have some more information in December or by December, shall I say, and we'll see you know, how the, the Biden executive order uh, lands and we've got a, a couple of months here to see what's going to come out of that, but it's all swirling around us at the moment. Um, and there's the thought of, okay, now that this is coming, what does this mean for the tools that we're adopting now? How is that going to impact us? So kicking it over to you, Heather, to start with, um, what do you think about that? What's, how are these tools going to be impacted by these policies? You know, a year down the line, what do developers need to know and think about? Well, what I've been thinking about lately is it, it's actually quite unusual for a technology to be regulated. I mean, if you think about it, um, well, maybe like nuclear technology or <laughs> you know something that's actually like quite dangerous to people on a physical level. Um, but in software, you know, if you think of software as a technology, it's been largely unregulated. You know, and in in software, um, you you had to deal with lots of regulations if you were in a highly regulated space like financial services, health services, and so forth. But software, as just you know, per se, was never regulated. We've kind of lived in a wild west for software in all the time I've been practicing. Um, so it's very interesting to see a specific technology being regulated, kind of regardless of what people are doing with it. The executive order had some things in it about specific applications, but what we're going to see, I think, coming out of the U.S. and Europe is um, regulation of the technology itself. Now, um, you're exactly right that the government has trouble keeping up <laughs> with <the> technology <laughs> um, and putting out regulations. And if I can be a little bit cynical, um, the government, um, their track record on regulating technology is often not great, right? Because some of the regulation tends to happen as a, a reaction to public fear. <clears throat> and, uh, and when technology lawyers and people in the business, you know, engineers look at it and they read the regulations, they often make not a lot of sense, right? So people need to be aware that regulation is coming. It's going to be coming probably no matter what you do with AI, which is going to be weird. And also, there's going to be a lot of questions about um, what the regulations really mean because my estimate is that the, the, the baseline quality of the regulations might not be so great, at least at the beginning. So we have to kind of be braced for impact here mm -hmm. and, and be aware of what's coming. Um, it's, it's happening both in Europe and the US and other places too. Uh, but I think we're going to see a fairly heavy-handed approach to regulation of AI in this coming soon. Mm -hmm. And what about open source from that perspective? What, what, are you, what are you encouraged by or worried about in terms of how open source is being uh, addressed under some of the current proposals? Well, um, I, so I personally think that one of the reasons software was not highly regulated was because of open source. Like, there, there's this... Uh, this idea that if something is transparent, it's a little less necessary to put a lot of regulations on it. Uh, I don't think that's gonna happen with AI, in part because AI has you know, some serious transparency issues. I'm not just talking about the decisions that people make when they're licensing AI models and disclosing how that they train the models and so forth. There's just a technical, a lot more technical work to providing transparency in AI than there is in, say, open source. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, but if, if you're asking, will open source be um, tarred with the same brush, I think that's probably likely, uh, there, there is actually uh, some legislation that is in process in the EU right now, which is 
really a little bit scary. Of oh, the cyber resilience act uh, yeah, you're talking cyber, about? Yeah, yeah. Um, which uh, would have the effect of making open source authors responsible for kind of on a products liability basis mm -hmm. for what they do, which is something that everybody has always assumed in the past would not be the case. This, this, re this uh, legislation specifically says that open source yeah. is included, and that's actually of huge concern to people in the open source mm -hmm. community. Yeah, I think right now, I think what we're seeing is the council, though, is starting to take a, a more practical approach I to hope this so. in terms of... Because uh, I may have to retire. <laughs> In terms of uh, that discussion, so we're, I think we're, we're uh, expecting that they will be able to hopefully prevail on that and understand yeah. that open source is really different than other uh, types of the software stack. And I think in the, the AI Act and um, in what we've seen coming out of other efforts is that at least, you know, regulators providing them with understanding of what open source is, why it's important, it's why it's important not to chill innovation in that area has really helped uh, when you think about the efforts now that are really on large foundational models and that are on um, high risk scenarios. Um, so I'd expect that if open source is a, it's a foundational model, then you might see some there, but it looks like at least I'm, I think I'm a little bit more optimistic maybe than you are in terms of of where the, where the regulators are going to ultimately wind up in this area. Um, Jen, you, you know, you've touched already on, on kind of know your vendor yeah. uh, in the area of regulation, um, but you know, what, what are your thoughts on what you see coming and, yeah. and what you're worried about, what you're excited about um, yeah. for Redfin? Yeah, I mean, I want to expand a little bit on, on uh, what Heather was saying on, on using AI responsibly. It's, it's like the, the regulators are not going to land that for us. We're going to have to land that for <laughs> yeah. ourselves. Um, and so, uh, you know, using Redfin as an example, I think about, you know, we have a lot of years, 20 years of experience in fair housing laws. And so, you know, our responsibility as engineers is to make sure that we're not violating that in our code and in anything that AI produces for us. And so that's where we come in and, and are empowered to sort of take that stance. But I think the bigger lever is, is educating our CEOs, both, you know, in industry and um, with our, our vendor partners. So, you know, obviously you want to select a vendor that, you know, you have a trusted relationship with and you've gone through all the checks and balances. But really what we look for at Redfin is like, who's going to represent us well in the industry? Who do we know that is out there advocating for, um, you know, for basically best practices in engineering? Who is, you know, on top of trends? Who is advocating for developers and their growth? And that reminds me of GitHub. You know, I was saying yesterday, um, you know, when you fill out uh, any application, it's like, you know, tell me what's your GitHub site, you know, that, that's part of your brand. And so GitHub has been a partner that we trust because you're part of the industry. You've really integrated yourself into that. And so that is part of selecting the right vendor is making sure that they're gonna be in public representing your values. Great, and, and one thing that we talked a little bit about was, was bias. Mm -hmm. And you have some opinions about bias and how you kind of think about that. Did you want to? Yeah, I mean, gosh, wouldn't it be great if we could just like regulate not having it? Um, <laughs> but you know, well, well, we could. It might human, not work. Well, right, yeah. <laughs> human, we are. Um, yeah, I think it just kind of goes back to um, you know what I was saying about making sure that bias doesn't show up in our code um, mm -hmm. and in our and what we're generating in AI. Um, I, I think it takes human interaction to do that. Uh, we all come with our own biases, which is why you have your code, your, your peers review your code, right? So I think it's just part of creating a best practice around AI is making sure that you're double checking yourself, that you're not just blindly accepting something. And that is probably the safest way you can get through that, that hurdle. Yeah. Well, moving on to some, some of the practical tips to provide um, yeah. What are your re best practices to share uh, with everyone here today? I know you've been just yeah. really a leader in this area, so I know yeah. people would love to hear from you on how you're implementing best practices around responsible AI in your yeah. company. I think if I've learned anything in my current role, it's that I don't know anything about how an engineer <laughs> is going to use something. I think I do, and then it turns out I don't. Um, and so I, I think the best practice is really driven by context. 
So a lot of um, folks are using Copilot who are more senior to do rote tasks that they don't want to do. The policy and the best practice around how you use AI in that scenario is probably different than how you're going to use it for a, a more junior engineer who's using it to learn. Um, and so having you know, a broad strokes approach to any sort of best practices just doesn't really work and people are annoyed by it. Mm -hmm. So I could say, you know, this is the set of use cases that you're gonna be able to use this for and like that's it, but that's just not effective. You really have to like dig in and understand how are people using the tool and you're often surprised by how people are using the tool um, and then shape the, the values and the best practices around those use cases. So for us, it's just been really understanding how people are using it and what's working for them. And we're often surprised. Like, I'm really surprised how many people are using it as more of like a, a pair programming uh, tool mm -hmm. than they are just pure code generation. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a huge learning for me. And it's like, OK, we're going to have to put in some processes to safeguard ourselves because right now you can deploy to production uh, with just one peer review. Do we need? another. So mm -hmm. those are the kinds of things I try to think about instead of the broad strokes approach. Mm -hmm. Well, that, to, to your point of um, you know, how, you're, how you're looking at it and reviewing it, I mean, Heather, you and I have talked about before about, well, sometimes like kind of what's, what's new is already old. Mm -hmm. and, um, <laughs> and it's things we've used for a long time um, mm -hmm. that aren't necessarily new just because we're talking about AI. Um, how do you think about what the existing policies and practices from you know, pre-AI days are that should be used uh, on how we, uh, how we deal with AI within our companies? Well, I think you're exactly right. You, you cannot anticipate the use cases, right? So, so <laughs> you think you can, though, every you, time. <laughs> I think it, I can do it. <laughs> your, your, your dev team is going to be more creative and, um, and, and wonderful than, than you'll ever expect. Um, so I think one of the things that we need to sort of graft on from open source and, and the way that we manage that is, is to understand that doing compliance right, no matter you know, where it is, is really mostly a question of educating people about what the risks are and, and, and teaching them to make the right decisions. Because there's one sort of mantra in counseling uh, as a lawyer, you know, on open source, and that is that most of the compliance decisions are engineering decisions. Mm -hmm. um, you don't push all the issues to legal because that's not even where it belongs. You, you sort of set some guardrails and you say, okay, now you're responsible for making the decision as to whether using this thing in this way is going to be compliant. If you look at a 50,000 foot view, it's exactly the same as we encountered with open source. So it's not a question of just saying you can only do X, Y, and Z. It's a question of, um, involving your dev team in the process and saying, okay, we're gonna learn together how to do this right, and then you're going to be responsible for doing it right, and then we as legal are here to help you if you have tough decisions to make. And I think that's always the right approach. It enfranchises you know, everybody and helps them be collaborative so that the engineers and the lawyers don't get at loggerheads and think that they're trying to do different things. Yeah. Um, and I would love, I think eventually we will see that that kind of compliance approach gets um, extracted from what we did with open source and gets applied to, uh, to AI. Mm -hmm. And I think what's one of the things that's been cool is to see all the open sourcing of responsible AI. Mm -hmm. um, you know, companies are putting out what they do. Um, Heather, you've authored some great um, guidance for companies around policies for uh, for the use of AI within their companies. So I think you know developers should uh, definitely uh, point their legal teams to some of the guidance that's out there if you're out there, you know, trying to. Um, help champion tools at your companies. One of them is a great uh, article that Heather put out. We've got you know, the Trust Center and some other things online, as does um, Microsoft has got a great responsible AI site um, that people can learn from, which I think is pretty cool. Um, let's double down on this like skilling mm -hmm. and upskilling and the development practice because you know, there's been a lot of talk about 
And what do we do now that we yeah. have AI in terms of how do we need to differently train our developers? Mm -hmm. And that junior developer mm -hmm. uh, example that you were talking about, we've heard, I've heard from customers around the world on like, how do we think about retraining our workforce? How do we think about the role of the junior developer and the role of the senior developer once we're using AI? So Jen, any thoughts from you on how you guys are thinking about skilling and training yeah. across the organization? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's been a place for your typical sort of training scenario where you're in a class and you're learning with other people. But I think, I mean, for me as an engineer, and I think for a lot of people, it's, it's the feedback mechanism, it's the two-way training that really works for people. Um, and so I, I think a combination approach is like what I always you know, ask for is like you get the basics in the big training class or the online course. Um, you kind of know how dangerous it is and what the risks are that you should be aware of, but really the real learning happens when you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so finding safe ways to do that in your workplace, again, finding a vendor that you trust, um, <laughs> having a process that you trust. Um, but I, I think that you know the best thing you can do as an engineer, it's like any technology is just being on top of it, being here today, um, you know, being engaged uh, with vendors and understanding their their releases that they put out, reading what's online as much as you can to see the variety of, of implementations. But training is not a one-size-fits-all approach. Well, we are just about at time, and we've covered a lot of territory. Uh, we've covered regulation, upcoming regulation, our concerns about it, our excitement about it. We've covered security. We've covered data governance. We've covered skilling. Um, a lot of topics here that I hope were helpful um, to folks, and particularly the best practices that we've shared. Uh, as we close out here, we'll do a little lightning round. Um, mm. Any final thoughts, starting with you, Jen? Um, I think, you know, I, my general message is just like not being afraid of the future. I, you know, 20, 30 years ago, we were all like, you know, concerned that the computers were going to take over the world, and that was way before <laughs> AI. Um, so, you know, I think when you think about what code is, is actually like a bunch of decisions made by humans. So, yes, sure, it's like run on a computer, but it's actually a human endeavor. And so I try to think about it that way. Um, and, you know, I just think back, I was watching this silly. TV uh, commercial from like 1993 when we were introducing credit cards and they were interviewing <laughs> people at a Burger King who were using their credit cards or who weren't using their credit cards and these people were like incredulous. They're like, I would never want to give my credit card information to a Burger King. How unsafe <laughs> is that? Oh my God. You know, and so it, it's not that that's not that long ago um, that that happened, right? So I think, you know, the fear has always been there. Um, but resistance is futile. So probably my takeaway is just like, learn what you can, come to conferences like this, and empower yourself to be the expert so that you, know, you can lead your organization forward. I love it. Don't be afraid, be smart. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Heather. Uh, well, it seems to me that AI is pretty much software 2.0. I mean, we, we, cannot, we cannot stop the, the migration from kind of old-fashioned coding like I learned before the earth cooled, you know, <laughs> to, uh, to AI. It's, it's, it's coming, um, and, and we'll deal with it, you know. Um, what I would say is um, I'm a big advocate of transparency because mm -hmm. of my work in open source, and so even if we get strong regulation in the AI area, I also want to see transparency because sunlight is the best disinfectant, and I, I think, I hope, what, one thing that happens in AI is what happened with software, which is that people understood the value of transparency and, and therefore it grew whether it was uh, you know, mandated or not. So I don't think regulation is the only answer. I think we need regulation and transparency, and I hope that we can find a mix of those in a way that you know, doesn't hamper innovation. Spoken like a true open source advocate. Transparency, <laughs> transparency, transparency. I love it. You know, GitHub is the home for open source, and it's something that we are the really proud and honored stewards of. So yeah. thank you very much, both thank of you, you, for coming today. This is a real treat for me, and I hope you all learned a lot. Thanks so much. Have a great rest of your universe. Thank you. Thank you.